Okay, well, here is uh, what I would like to talk about today. Um, my talk is called Red or Green. It's not just about hot salsa and traffic lights. And my sub subtitle is What Does Conservation Success Really Mean for Threatened Cranes and Wild Places and Communities? This is an entirely new talk that I put together kind of in response to some recent changes in the crane world. And I thought it was a good time to really talk about what all these different systems mean and to give some stories from the crane world to try to help you better understand this whole concept of endangered and conservation success. So I hope that's helpful to you. I had fun putting this talk together and um, uh, we will roll with it. It's, this is not a highly technical talk, but compared to some of the talks I give, which are pretty high level overview, I do have a few bulleted lists and a graph or two um, to help us kind of get through this, but it, it's not meant to be a highly technical talk, but, but is meant to help you understand a little bit more about um, how we think about endangered and conservation success. Just briefly about me, I know many of you have met me in person or, or we've met over the years uh, virtually. Uh, again, I'm president and CEO of the International Crane Foundation. I have been in that position for about 12 years, but I've been with the Crane Foundation since the 1980s. Uh, some of the most satisfying work I've had over the years besides here in Baraboo has been uh, living in Nepal for a year and helping with our work there. I spent a good part of four years in Vietnam uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, really enriching experience working with our Vietnamese colleagues. Uh, and then a lot of years in Africa, my job actually with the Crane Foundation for about 15 years was, was to develop our programs in Africa, which are now so wonderfully managed by Karen Morrison and our teams in Africa, as it should be. Uh, but I spent a lot of time in Mozambique, more recently Zambia. Uh, I left the Crane Foundation for about four years to work on the Gorongosa restoration project and live in Mozambique, which was also a tremendous experience. Um, and I consider myself to be a hydrologist by training and a naturalist here in Wisconsin. Uh, and my latest thing now, I used to put up a picture of unicycling and other crazy things, but I've decided that my new sport is actually the Bino Athlon. I just went hiking with my son who hikes at about three or four miles an hour through steep hills, which just about killed me. And I was of course out in the mountains looking for birds. So I had to learn how to hike, run, and then still myself to look with binoculars to see birds. So. My new talent I've decided is the bino athlon, at least when I'm chasing my kid. So that's something about me. Now let's talk about something about cranes. So when you visit our beautiful new site, and I know a lot of you have been to our beautiful new site or hope to get there someday soon. One of the things you'll see in our new George Archibald Welcome Center is this giant wall uh, art here. And it has some words on it. The first word is elegant. Well, we know, Cranes are elegant. Cranes are spectacular. Look at these blue cranes. I mean, they're very elegant birds, no surprise there. It also says the word inspiring, and we know cranes are inspiring uh, around the world. And I, I just wanna give a shout out to Nancy Merrill and the Colorado Crane Conservation Coalition. I'm just back from the Yampa Valley in Colorado. They ran a great festival that was utterly inspiring, all kinds of speakers and field trips. There's no doubt that cranes inspire us to do good things. Another word on our wall of fame there in our new Welcome Center is ancient. Cranes are ancient. They go nearly back to the time of dinosaurs. They're some of the oldest extent birds like our sandhills here. Uh, they're found in Aboriginal art uh, around the world. And really what's more ancient than this? All of this. Just so, Yes, cranes are ancient. And finally, elusive. What do we mean by elusive? Well, cranes often take us to some really remote parts of the world, uh, like these black neck cranes, little doubt, doubt, dots out there in the Himalayan mountains, or think about the incredible remote breeding grounds of the whooping cranes up in Wood Buffalo Park in, uh, in Canada and so on. And also through their rareness, cranes are also elusive. So I think we can get our minds around uh, around there being ancient and inspiring and elegant and elusive, no problem. And cranes are also endangered, but what, what do we mean by that? You probably go outside if you live in Wisconsin, see lots of sandhill cranes. Uh, maybe you followed the story of the recovery of whooping cranes, you, so you know something about our rarest and most abundant birds. What do we mean by endangered? That's, that's a big part of the goal of my talk, which is how do we measure endangered? What does it really mean? And how do we know when to celebrate success? 
We know how to call cranes endangered, but how do we know when to celebrate conservation success? And a couple of recent changes in the status of cranes out there, especially the red crowned crane and the black necked crane, which I have arrows pointing to, they help us think about this idea of endangered and conservation success because they've just been changed in their status. And I'll talk about that. So one big tool we have as a global community of citizens and, uh, and scientists and, and uh, policymakers and all of us is the red list of threatened species. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. Uh, this is what the red list does. You know, it was established in 1964 by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. That's that IUCN there. It uses scientific criteria to evaluate risk of extinction. I'll say that very specifically. So it uses data, it's very data driven to evaluate the risk of extinction. Uh, through the red list, we've looked at more than 140,000 species worldwide and probably should put an unhappy face here, but about 38,500 so far have been put on the red list as threatened with extinction. Um, it's widely accepted for policy and planning and awareness. It's used for all sorts of, of conventions uh, for national protection policies now, which is great. But I wanna be very clear, the IUCN red list is not the endangered species list that we have, for example, under the US Fish and Wildlife Service. That's quite a different thing that our system in the US is a mix for good or for bad of science and politics. There's no question about that. But the red list really tries to be purely data-driven and scientific. So it's, it's a really widely accepted system. Our IUCN crane specialist group, which ICF leads us and is a, is a part of, but goes much beyond ICF to our partners around the world. We provide a lot of the technical input for the red data list, but we don't decide what goes on the list. That's done by a small committee that evaluates the data and puts it on. Uh, other things to know, it uses categories of risk, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute to sort of convey conservation status. And there are strengths and limitations for understanding crane conservation and conservation impact, which is part of what I wanna talk about. These are the red list categories, and I'm gonna go through them for cranes in just a second, but to say that they, they, of course, they range a lot from extinct species. Fortunately, we don't have to talk about re any recent extinctions in the crane world, so that's not part of our current assessment, though it would be in the fossil record, all the way across to least concern. And I'm gonna talk about what these terms mean in the crane world in just a moment, but that's kind of the range from extinct uh, to threat various statuses of being threatened, uh, to what we call least concern where we're not uh, worried at present about threats. Wow, well, the IUCN red list applies to all creatures around the world. And if you sort of stare at this global map, it's both fascinating and depressing, but these are a lot of our species around the world that we know about that have different levels of threat and are on the IUCN red list of threatened species. Lots of species you know about, and invariably when people show uh, maps of the world like this. Somewhere in there is a crane. There's a Siberian crane near its range. You know, cranes often appear on this because cranes are one of the most endangered groups of birds in the world, of species in the world. So um, let's talk about why that is. So let's hone in here on the world of cranes. There are 15 species of cranes around the world. Um, we've got two here in North America, which I'll talk about a little bit later and throughout the talk. And then a lot of the cranes of the world are in Africa and Asia, where a lot of ICF's work and staff are focused, uh, as well as a couple species down in Australia. So that's a map of the cranes of the world. And now I'm gonna go a little bit deeper and talk about these categories. So the one crane species is in the most serious uh, IUCN red list category, which is called critically endangered. That means there's an extremely high risk of extinction. And that is our Siberian crane. Now the Siberian crane's actually been a pretty good story in recent years. There's about 4,500 4, in the wild and they've been increasing. But historically, as some of you may know, there was an entirely, there were two flyways of the Siberian crane. The one on your right, which is the flyway that's still extent today. But there was also a big flyway that's on your left here or to the, e, uh, to the west. Uh, there were big numbers of Siberian cranes back in the 60s and 70s. But that entire flyway and population has disappeared. And the bottom right Siberian crane is the last one that appeared in India 
uh, some years ago. So that's a good example of why Siberian cranes are considered critically endangered. We've lost half of that global population and all the remaining cranes are really concentrated, uh, for example, in the winter at Poyang Lake in China. So there's a lot of concern and threat there. There are two crane species considered at very high risk of extinction, a notch down from critically endangered, but still very much endangered on the threatened list. One of them is our whooping cranes here in the United States. There's less than 700 wild and reintroduced whooping cranes out in the wild. They have been steadily increasing. That's a great story. And we just had wonderful news on our staff call this morning about 102 nests found this year, a new record at Wood Buffalo National Park. That's all really good news. Um, but overall, we know this is a species still with a lot of effort to recover, including, sorry, uh, reintroduction efforts to bring them back to the eastern half of the United States. So whooping cranes are an endangered species. The other endangered species is the gray crowned crane. That, that is a species across West and Southern Africa. There's about 25, 30,000 gray crowned cranes in the world. And you say, wow, that's a lot more than our less than 700 whooping cranes, yet they're both endangered. Well, the big reason that, that the gray crowned cranes are on the endangered species list is they have been really in very steady decline in lots of places, notably not everywhere. They're doing okay in South Africa, but mostly they've been in decline. And they have a lot of direct threats. You know, when, when cranes habitats are threatened, we often see a long, slow decline or challenges in conservation. But when the birds are directly threatened, like by trade or poisoning, populations can go down very fast. And that's part of the reason why gray crown cranes have been declining so fast. Uh, at high risk of extinction are seven crane species. Um, so let's talk about those. They are considered vulnerable. That includes the red crown cranes. I'm gonna, uh, these are in order of their number in the wild. You can see the numbers there. I'm gonna come back and talk more about red crown cranes. Uh, the white naped crane, about 7,000 in the wild, also a vulnerable species. The wild old crane, the most aquatic uh, water dependent crane species in Africa, just shy of 10,000 in the wild. The hooded crane, this little beauty that migrates through East Asia, about 14 to 16,000 in the wild. The Saris crane, which has a whole bunch of distinct populations from India down to Australia, real mixed trends overall, probably stable or decreasing, but some real problem areas for the species. The blue crane, a species that has been a wonderful story in South Africa for a long time, but appears to be decreasing a bit now. And the most abundant, let's say, of the vulnerable threatened species are the black crown cranes. There's somewhere between 50 and 80,000 of them in the wild. Their status is unknown because they tend to inhabit some really difficult places to get to uh, in West Africa. Uh, we think they may be decreasing, but they are the vulnerable crane species of the world. The next category is kind of an exciting category to be in, in a way, because these are species that are not actually formally considered threatened, like the vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered, not considered threatened with imminent extinction, but they're sort of close to threatened species status. And we do have one species now, the black-necked crane in that category, it was actually moved from vulnerable to near threatened, and we'll talk about that um, in a moment. And then finally, least concern, uh, of course, not not our own personal feeling about the birds, but uh, statistically speaking in terms of risk, least concern, these are the species not at imminent concern of risk. We have four in the crane world. We have our Brolga cranes, Brolgos of Australia. We have the Demazel crane with a, with a wide range uh, across the Eurasian continent, uh, many, many more than some of the other numbers we've been talking about, but a species we're a little worried about due to, due to heavy hunting uh, in their range. And then we have the two really successful crane species of the world, the Eurasian cranes, which are in Europe and Asia, and have, for the most part have been increasing very steadily for a long time. And I just wanna pause here. I'm showing you a lot of photos today from many photographers around the world, many wonderful photographers. And this photo here uh, was taken by Carl von Truenfels, our dear friend and board member at the International Crane Foundation. Carl passed away yesterday. Uh, after decades of service to crane conservation in Europe, to ICF, uh, we really miss um, 
Carl, and I just want to acknowledge him here. Uh, of course, his beautiful photo and all of our photographers, but, um, but thank you, Carl, uh, for all, all that you did. Uh, you are a conservation hero and we will miss you. And finally, our most abundant crane, the Sandhill Crane here in the United States where I'm speaking today uh, with a population of, of, of about 827,000 in the world and increasing in lots of places, not everywhere, but lots of places. Okay, well, so the red list looks at extinction. Um, we all know that phrase, extinction is forever. So the red list is really great to catalyze planning and action. It's been at the core of supporting lots of national policies, international conventions for bird conservation, all very important. Um, it helps us prioritize funding. There's a number of donors that really focus on the most endangered and high risk species uh, for funding. That may be a very good reason to do so. Uh, it helps us promote education and awareness. Again, this extinction is forever idea that we so want to understand and promote. Um, it helps us guide scientific research, especially where we're data deficient in trying to understand the status of species, their range, how they're doing. That's all really good. Those are important qualities of the red list, which again is really focused on risk of extinction. But there's some limitations. Number one, I think we all know this, conservation is more than preventing extinction. We're in this not just to keep birds on the planet, but to celebrate conservation success. That's what I'll come back to. Uh, the Red List really focuses on global population numbers, much less on range or flyways or sites. And those may be where we care about cranes or other species most. So it's really taking a global perspective, not a local perspective. Um, data are often lacking to prove trends, even when we have a real intuitive sense and concern about things, uh, we may be lacking data. Uh, it's hard to capture future trends. It can touch on that a little, but it's not easy to incorporate future trends when you're looking at data streams, quantitative data to, to assess these uh, species. So future can be very hard to incorporate, but matters so much to conservation. And we know so many species are completely dependent on past or future conservation efforts. So a, a change of less threatened status can be very misleading when a species is so dependent on our work. Um, and finally, as the theme of this talk, it, it can be really hard to define conservation success using the red list. Well, what do I mean by that? Let's look at two recent examples. So our red crown cranes of East Asia were just moved or are in the process of being moved from endangered to vulnerable. So hooray, right? That's a little bit less risk of extinction. We like that. So should we celebrate success with a big red crown crane unison call? Well, let's talk about that. The reason red crown cranes were moved from endangered to vulnerable to a little bit better status is that their population is increasing. Overall, across their entire population, it's increasing. And a big part of that is on the island of Hokkaido, Japan, where red crown cranes are increasing significantly. Uh, they are dependent on feeding stations in Japan, so conservation effort. Uh, for that increase, but the Japanese have done a wonderful job of recovering this population since World War II. They're definitely increasing, that's a good thing. That is driving the overall increase. Then you've got two other populations. One of them migrates uh, from the North China, Russia down and winters up largely on the Korean Peninsula and in the demilitarized zone. Now they, that population is doing okay, it's increasing a little, but it's a great, concern. The DMZ is a highly contentious area. Its future is very uncertain. And there's not a lot of other places for red crown cranes to go there. So they are increasing a bit there, but it's far from secure. And then you've got a population in China that is really going down and has been steadily going down. There's just a few hundred left in this enormous mainland China range. There's lots of reasons for that uh, related to trade, loss of habitat. Our team is really focused there, but a, a really difficult story across China, Russia, Korea. Um, yes, a good story in Japan, but, but real concern. So should we unison call? Should we celebrate this, this re re reduction in risk of extinction? To me, I say no. I don't think it's a time to celebrate red crown cranes. I think we need to keep our crane heads down. We need to redouble our efforts. Of course, it's good to have a little bit improved statistically in their status, but I don't think it's time to celebrate red crown cranes. And I think our colleagues all across Asia would agree. 
How about our black neck cranes? Now they had a very interesting move this year from vulnerable, which is on the red list of threatened species to near threatened, still on the red list, but not actually a threatened species, right? By definition, they're now near threatened. Well, that's, that's pretty exciting. Should we soar in celebration with our black neck crane friends? Well, let's take stock. First of all, we have a long history in China helping these birds. Uh, the project at Cao Hai here, this photo is back from the 1980s, was one of the first community-based conservation projects in the world and in China, a wonderful effort to try and find real sustainable community-based solutions for black neck cranes. Also, the Chinese have made a tremendous commitment to saving this bird, many, many protected areas in China, uh, all throughout Western China trying to save these birds. There's also been a ton of great effort in Bhutan, uh, really trying to secure these birds. And on top of all of that, lots of new protected areas, lots of community work. We've had wonderful people, especially Dr. Li Fengshan, who retired recently, who dedicated his life largely to the black neck crane, built a huge, um, huge network of black neck crane scientists across their range uh, and really moved forward their cause for conservation. So lots of good stuff happening with black neck cranes. Um, as always, uh, nothing is secure. And um, although all this great stuff has happened, we do remain worried about black neck cranes in large part because they nest in the highlands of the Himalayas, highlands of the Tibetan plateau and all. And their nests are really in the meltwaters, wetlands that are the meltwaters of the Himalayan glaciers. And right now those glaciers are melting due to climate change, there's no doubt about that. And as they melt, those birds have more habitat right now. There's actually more runoff, but over time, those glaciers are gonna recede, those meltwaters are no longer gonna come in and we're gonna have problems for this species. So um, what can we say about black neck cranes? Should we soar in celebration? I say for now, yes, it's a true conservation success story. We really do celebrate all the great work for black neck cranes, um, but there's no doubt we need further action and innovation to ensure their future. We've got to figure out how to keep them going on, on some challenging breeding grounds, no doubt about that. Well, I've given a couple examples of some of the limitations of the red list. And uh, so I'm pleased to announce there's a new list coming out. And it helps us shift our thinking from preventing extinction to achieving full recovery. And that's what we want in conservation. We wanna see birds in the wild. We want them in our backyards. We want them in the natural places. We want recovery. So that's what the IUCN green status is all about as a new companion to the red status. And here, what do we need? Why do we need a green status? Well, a couple of important things. We look at species recovery, not just uh, avoiding extinction, but their recovery. It helps us recognize conservation achievement, which they call it legacy. That is how has past conservation got us where we are today, so important. It acknowledges that our dependency of the dependency of species on continued conservation action. So we know, yeah, maybe a species is getting moved to a more improved status, but that doesn't mean they're any less dependent on what we're doing. It helps us forecast the future impact of conservation action. And it emphasizes the ecological functioning, the roles of species in the wild, not just their viability, not just their presence in, or absence, but are they really ecologically functioning? Are they meeting their needs? Are they interacting with other species in the wild across their entire natural range? That's a big part of the green status. So it brings a lot of new thinking in that's very exciting. Well, here's my most technical slide of the presentation. I'll just try to help you through this a little. So the green score, the new green status looks at two things, as I said. One is how close is the species to fully recovering, something we're all really interested in, and what's the impact of conservation effort? So how is our effort propping up the species, helping it move forward? How has it done so historically? So it uses some useful terms. And a graph like this, I know that this is not easy uh, to follow, but we sort of start with the original state of the species in the past, and we move to the present and on to the short term and the long term future. We, to understand its species in the present, we need to understand the conservation legacy, which is basically how is the species doing today in terms of numbers? What's its green score compared to how it would be doing if we didn't do anything? I think we can get our minds around that. It's not always easy to prick those things, but if we did nothing, there would be a lot less whooping cranes, a lot less red crowned cranes, and so on and so forth. 
Um, then there's a couple of things. Conservation dependence starts to look at the future and it says, first of all, it has sort of the, a null case you might say, which is what happens if we stop doing anything tomorrow? What would be the decline of the species or not if the species is holding its own? So it, it kind of gives us a sense of how would that species be in the near future, say in the next five to 10 years, it, it roughly looks at 10 years with conservation action. And then the conservation gain goes on top of that and says, what's our future because of conservation action? Not only what are we not losing, but what are we gaining uh, through that conservation effort over say the next 10 years? And that's our conservation gain. So they're, they're technical, these are quantitative statistical sort of terms, but I think we can get our minds around them. Legacy is our history. Dependence is the future. What, how bad would things be without us? And the gain is how good can things be with us? And it's all really getting at what's the recovery potential for the species? How, how much better can we get from their current state in the long term to some future state? It's never going to be in most cases 100% fully recovered. We're never going to have cranes in most cases everywhere they used to be. But we can push pretty far towards that. And that's that's what it's all about. So that's that's a, that's a graph to kind of give you a sense of how that works. Um, I want to shout out uh, a couple of people on our staff, Christy Craig in South Africa and Claire Mirandi here at ICF. Claire's been with us for like 37 years at ICF and also Elena Ilyashenko who also contributed to this great new paper in conservation biology. This is the two first two pages of the paper just listing authors. A lot of people contributed, but I'm proud to have team members on here who helped us look at um, the Siberian crane and the blue crane as some of the first ever test species for this new green status. So what did we learn? Again, these are very quantitative things and I'm not gonna throw these quantitative numbers at you. I just wanna give you an impression. What did we learn about the green status of the Siberian crane? Well, first of all, we really have to grapple with what's their recovery potential. Uh, they are doing well on this Eastern flyway and they have disappeared, as I said, from their Western flyway. Is there potential for recovery in the West in countries like India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, and through Kazakhstan and in Russia where they fly? That's a very challenging region in the long term. We hope so. In the near term, probably not so much. Um, so a lot of the recovery is going to be in East Asia. So we have to kind of grapple with what recovery means as a percent of historic for the Siberian crane with that lost range and everything else. But there's a great conservation legacy and dependence for the Siberian cranes, wonderful work in the past and continuing on securing safe, safe si uh, flyways for Siberian cranes and really looking at the critical places they need from their breeding grounds to their key stopover areas, to their wintering grounds. I mentioned before Poyang Lake, really having that flyway secure, that's part of their conservation legacy through today and their dependence in the future is on that good work. And in addition, there's real gains. Uh, Siberian crane, I heard Spike Millington say the other day, the, the, the Siberian crane is almost sort of untouchable in China. Uh, there's been wonderful outreach. This is a photo from a, a recent celebration of the Siberian crane at Poyang Lake. Um, where can you see a show like that for a crane? Huh? Pretty fantastic. So there's gains to be made and a better future for the species uh, through that attention. So again, the green status uh, has challenges like in terms of their recovery, but also some, some good news and some real opportunity. And I think it, it's, it's exciting to look at how the green status teaches us conservation impact for the Siberian crane. The blue crane is kind of an interesting story. The blue crane is national bird of South Africa. These gorgeous birds have been in this wonderful long-term recovery, but it's been sort of complicated. There's a few birds up in Namibia to the north, but really the population is centered in South Africa. And about 30 years ago, they had this big shift from uh, eastern parts of South Africa down to the region shown there as the Overberg and, and parts of the Karoo and Svartland where they really shifted and took advantage of habitats in this new area. Uh, some of these areas are drier. Um, they also produce winter wheat and other foods that the Siberian cranes like. So they, the recovery potential is kind of looking at reoccupying their whole range and, and what is their chance to really fully recover here, but they've been a good story. And a big part of the blue crane success has been the great work under the Endangered Wildlife Trust, our great partner in South Africa, preventing uh, poisonings of, of blue cranes on farms, which was a big problem uh, 30 years ago, still can be a problem, but much less so. 
and power line collisions. They've done wonderful work uh, getting power lines moved, getting them marked, working with the power line companies that put them in and really helping us uh, help the blue cranes in South Africa. Wonderful work and it's really made a difference for them. So there's an important historic legacy and a dependence on the future on that good work. And the future for blue cranes is really about adapting to agriculture and climate change in South Africa. What gains can we make towards recovery? Uh, it's a species that's been in increase, but may actually be a little bit decreasing now because of those challenges. So it's a, a species that the story is not told, but I think, again, the green status can really help us think about the future of the species in a much better way than just avoided extinction. We're not worried about blue cranes going, avoiding extinction. We're not worried about them going extinct. We are concerned about their continued gains and recovery in the wild. What does the green status tell us about our most abundant and our rarest cranes? Well, let's start with the whoopers. This chart you've often probably seen in our talks kind of tells it all. There's about 800 whooping cranes in the wild. You probably are familiar with the story of how we got down to fewer than, well, only about 20 in the world, maybe 15 in the wild. Uh, those species have come back. We now have a little bit more than 500 in the wild uh, on their natural migration and another 100 60 or so uh, reintroduced in the lighter, in the orange color there. Whooping cranes are all about recovery, right? I mean, you can't be more about recovery when you get down to so few that they truly did almost go extinct. So they're all about really an exciting recovery potential and how far can they go with reintroduction, with the continued recovery of um, the natural uh, Canada down to Texas population. But there's no doubt the future of whooping cranes is going to be about continued conservation dependence, whether it's dealing with water and land issues in Texas to keep that flock going or ongoing reintroduction efforts here in the east or trying to prevent shootings with good outreach work. There is no doubt that the future of whooping cranes is one of conservation dependence and it's important to show even if they get downlisted or changed in their status someday from let's say endangered to vulnerable uh, as they are less at risk of extinction, we know that their conservation uh, dependence is significant and we can't lose sight of that no matter what their red list status might be, right? Okay, for our sandhills, well, can we dance and trumpet with our sandhill cranes? Yes, I say, uh, you have my stamp of approval on that. I mean, sandhills are a wonderful recovery story. These incredible scenes from the Platte River here where I am in Wisconsin, just the whole notion that we got about 80,000 birds migrating or breeding in Wisconsin. I mean, it's just wonderful. It's been a great story to have sandhills back in our lives. Sandhills are seen flying over Chicago. They're repopulating uh, places like Ohio and the Eastern US. It's, it's a great story. I was just, as I mentioned at the Yampa Valley Festival where they're celebrating their flights through uh, the Colorado Rockies. I mean, it's exciting. So that's a great recovery story. And it's such a great conservation legacy. It's about power of things like the Migratory Bird Treaty Act to really curtail excessive hunting uh, to help the population recover are so important. It's about the role of farmers, hunters, everyone who stepped up to help save wetlands, uh, the key habitat for cranes. It's about farmers letting cranes be on their lands and survive on their wetlands. You know, it's such an important conservation legacy about people working together to bring these birds back. Really good story. But again, we can never take conservation gains for granted. Now we have the problem of abundance with sandhill cranes. It's a good problem to have, but they're on farms. We know they're causing prop problems in some places. There are pressures to hunt sandhills because that is linked uh, to crop depredation, although there are much better ways to solve crop depredation than hunting. But the fact of the matter is we have to consider to stay involved. We have to keep working with farmers and figure out how to keep the positive relationship between farmers and cranes that's fueled their recovery, which means helping farmers and helping cranes. So great story with sandhill cranes, but let's not take it for granted. You know, we lost our passenger pigeons, right? Need I say more, uh, abundance does not mean secure forever and we always have to understand that. So we talked a little bit about the red list. We talked a little bit about the green list, at least enough to give you a dabble. Maybe you wanna read a little more about them or, or uh, explore our website. So I say red, green, or maybe blue. What, how do we think about conservation success at the International Crane Foundation? What should we think about? Well, of course we gotta think about cranes. I've got our mission statement here because it kind of helps me guide my thinking through this. 
this talk's been all about cranes. That's really important. But there's also, you know, core to our mission, the ecosystems, the watersheds that support them and the flyways they traverse. That's a big part of our mission. And also a big part of our mission is providing conservation leadership to engaging people in resolving threats. If we expand a little from our mission to our vision, also, of course, dedicated to the 15 species of cranes, but a big part of our vision too is that we bring people together through the vision, through the charisma of cranes, that cranes draw us together. And through that, we find new ways to think about our water and our lands and our livelihood. So to me, conservation success at the International Crane Foundation really revolves around these ideas, ecosystems, watersheds, flyways, new ways to manage and secure them, bringing us together to do better. All right, well, what does that mean? It means a commitment to healthy wetlands. So to me, how we're doing, for example, on the Kafui Flats here, where we've just signed a 20-year agreement, that's a lot about conservation success. Can we keep these healthy, these wetlands, these big wetlands healthy, big and small? Can we keep them healthy? Same for grasslands. They are ecosystems that support cranes. This is from the uh, from Mongolia, from the Kirkpiten River Valley, where we're working in Mongolia, another long-term conservation agreement for healthy grasslands and the wetlands that are within them. For the white naped crane, you even got a little demoiselle crane in the background. Several species use that area. Healthy wetlands, healthy grasslands. But ecosystems are also farmlands. We need healthy farmlands as well. And a lot of our cranes, not just our sandhills, uh, a lot of our cranes of the world depend on healthy farmlands, um, especially in Africa and Southeast Asia. We have some tools for that too. There is an IUCN green list, not to be confused with the green status. Sorry about that. I can't help these names. There's a red list and a green status and a green list. Well, the green list is about best practices for conservation areas. It's a program to certify protected and conserved areas like our national parks, community conserved areas, our nature reserves, and so on. Those that are managed well, managed effectively, and governed fairly. So that's a, that's a nice tool to have in the toolbox besides the red list and the green status to have a way to acknowledge. And I certainly hope places like the Kafui Flats and uh, our conservation areas in Mongolia and China and everywhere else will have green list status as really well-managed sites. So that's a wonderful goal. But we've got to be innovative beyond that. And we try to be innovative, especially in thinking about some of these ecosystems like in Myanmar, where we're aching to get going. We've been held up um, by the coup there and COVID and everything else, but I think this is the kind of innovative way we need to think about ecosystems. Floating rice 2.0, not going back to traditional floating rice that was kind of synonymous with poverty. Looking forward to floating rice 2.0, that's about safe food, sustainable livelihoods, clean water, and more cranes and other wildlife. So we'll be talking about that more in the future. Tron Tritt gave a talk on that not so long ago. Um, so innovative ways. Also, like in East Africa, thinking about sustainable agriculture as a way to help people farm uplands and not need to farm wetlands, like climate smart agriculture that's being done in Kenya, uh, looking at soil fertility, drought resistance of native plants and fruit trees, about vegetable gardening, about different ways to combat climate change and promote more sustainable use of land that doesn't require uh, wetland development, right? So that's a, a real important goal for us. So. Those are really good examples of where we evaluate uh, conservation success from an ecosystem perspective, healthy wetlands, healthy gra grasslands, healthy farmlands, right? We also need healthy watersheds because all of those places need water and water comes from the broader watersheds or catchments. If you're watching from Asia, Europe, Africa, um, same idea, same term. Um, watersheds like the Zambezi River Basin that ultimately supports places like the Kafui Flats and a lot of other important places for wattled cranes. Watersheds can be big and small too, like, like crane ecosystems, but the health of those watersheds is so intertied to the health of ecosystems, which is the health of cranes and our conservation impact. Broadening even more from the health of uh, these uh, watersheds and ecosystems is the flyways the birds traverse. I've already talked about that a fair bit, but for East Asia, for North America, these cranes are traversing huge flyways from far Northern areas, thousands of miles to far Southern areas. All along those places, we need those ecosystems that the cranes need to stop. And we need those watersheds that support those individual ecosystems. And then we just magnify it 
at the flyway level. We need those best management practices that the green list is all about, and we need to keep it going, right? So really complicated ideas, but it's, it's so much more than just places and even watersheds. It's all across the landscape of flyways. And ultimately, you can see where this is going as we go up and up and up. Of course, we need a healthy planet. We have to be able to fight climate change. We have to be able to adapt uh, to climate change increasingly as well. Um, this map of, of uh, this is actually a map showing changes in runoff around the world in red and all those overlap with some really important green areas for us. And um, there's no doubt about that. Part of a healthy, healthy planet, we hope, and this is part of our vision statement, I read a minute ago is a more diverse world through the charisma of cranes. It's the idea that cranes can be umbrellas or flagships for conservation, um, that by conserving areas for cranes, we can help lots of other species. That's what we're striving to do. And I see that as such an important part of how we define conservation success. Not only are we saving cranes, not only are we saving these broader ecosystems and watersheds and broader flyways, but are other species carrying along as well? Can we use the, the wonderful charisma of cranes to help save other species that are lesser known, lesser appreciated, as the case may be? A very important role for us in defining conservation success. Conservation success also means having conservation in leadership, conservation leadership in place where it matters most, whether that's in Africa for us, in Asia, here in North America. It's having the right people out, working with other people helping inspire people, helping share knowledge, helping share innovation uh, for the future. So conservation leadership in place, well-trained, well-mentored is part of how we define conservation success as well. And then finally, completely intertied to all of this is that crane places are people places. And we really can't evaluate conservation success independently of the health, of the resiliency, of the livelihoods of the communities that we work with. These are scenes from East Africa where there's been a lot of work. We could show scenes from China. We could show scenes from elsewhere in Asia. We could show scenes from elsewhere in Africa or here in North America, all in different ways, all playing out in different ways. But the resilience of communities um, to deal with poverty, to deal with climate change, to deal with all sorts of, of, of challenges, um, their health, their population, the environment they live in, their livelihoods, that is all fundamental to conservation success. We may measure that at times in number of cranes, and that's our first order. We may look at numbers of cranes and, and to be some gauge how we're doing, but it's a lot more than that. If we want to understand how they're going to do into the future, if we want to maintain progress, that is continue conservation gain, reduce conservation dependence and continue conservation gain towards full recovery, like we're talking about with the green list, that is about resilient communities and their livelihoods every bit as much as it's about cranes and the places they need. So that, that is the big picture on how that goes. So to kind of wrap all this up, we, we have a red list that helps us understand extinction. I hope I've helped you understand a little bit why some of the crane species of the world are with the status they have on the red list. We have this new green list, which I'm delighted about. It's a great new tool. We will be evaluating all 15 crane species uh, with that green, uh, the green status. Let me get my nomenclature right here, the green status. We will be evaluating all 15 crane species with that going forward. Uh, and that'll shed a lot more light on the conservation needs of cranes. For most cranes, I think a lot more light than the red list, which is gonna be great. But of course the two work together. And then I shared a little bit about sort of the I use ICF, ICF blue list, if you will, which is just how we think about conservation success, the ways we might capture success in our work as we think out beyond today and into the future um, in our horizons of planning for 10 years or the indefinite future. And I just wanna close by saying we are all part of conservation success. When we care, we engage. When we engage, we act. When we act, we save cranes, we save the places we need, ecosystems, their watersheds, their flyways, our planet. We help the communities, uh, sometimes our own, sometimes other communities that care for cranes. We do all that when we engage. I'm so grateful for all of you who support us in so many ways, our members, our supporters, who travel with us, all the things you do. And I know so many of you out there are working locally 
uh, in conservation for other species in other places, um, you're all a part of conservation success because we're all in this uh, together. So red, green, or blue, we can measure it this way or that way, but it all comes down to really how we all get out there and roll up our sleeves and get things done. That's my take home message here. Well, there's lots of resources out there. I wrote a blog recently about um, these changes, very similar to the talk I just uh, read, uh, just gave. You can read that on our website. Uh, if you go to the World Conservation Union or IUCN website, you can find out all about the green status. You can find that new conservation biology paper, all sorts of stuff. If you wanna get real wonky on all the policy and everything, you can have at it and, and go in much greater depth than I presented today, but that gives you a sense, I hope, of there. And you can learn a lot more about the red list of threatened species um, through IUCN as well. And you know, just to add confusion to it, uh, the International Green Foundation is a member of the IUCN. Uh, uh, and we also are the leaders of the global uh, crane specialist group under the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So we're, these are very close partners of ours um, in conservation and we're all in it together, like I said. And with that, I would love to take your questions or comments and I'm gonna invite Spike here to join me. Thanks, Spike. Thanks a lot, Rich. That's a great explanation of the of the red list and the and the green status. I think it was very very clear. And also, it's a very timely talk because, as many of you may know, IUCN is currently holding its World Conservation Congress, which it does every four years. And there are major themes on the red list and the green status. There's a whole session called "Recovering the Red," and uh, many sessions on the on this new uh, green status which everyone is excited about so i i first wanted to ask uh, rich a question about people may be a little bit confused when you look at the different species and the different categories you mentioned that um, black crown cranes have pretty good numbers seemingly much more than the black neck cranes yet their status is very different so what does that mean for populations, small populations that you know, are at risk of some random events where their numbers could decline very quickly versus a larger population where you know, there may be declines, but it's more gradual? Uh, thank you so much for asking that question. That's uh, something I wanted to touch on in the talk and didn't, so I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity. You may have noticed if you were following the whirlwind of cranes of the world that the great crown crane which is endangered, there's a lot more of them, maybe 30,000 than a bunch of, of species that are classified as vulnerable, like red crowned and white naped and wattled cranes and so on. So, so as Spike said, as he's framed, numbers are not the only game here. The red list really looks at trends. And the reason that gray crowned cranes are endangered is they've had about an 80% 80, 80 global population decline over the last 30 years. That's a technical, category of decline that moves them very rapidly. In fact, when ICF was born, <laughs> the, the uh, gray crown cranes weren't, they were least concerned. They weren't even on the threatened list within the red list, but we really were concerned. We wanted more conservation action and we pushed to get them moved eventually to endangered based on those clear trends we saw. So rareness matters uh, in endangerment, you know, with our whooping cranes being still so few, fewer than 700 in the wild, that rareness does matter. But the red list is really keying on trends and trends require a lot of data. You gotta have data from yesterday and today and today and tomorrow to get trends. And um, so it's not just about the absolute numbers. Uh, we really need to understand where they're trending and you know, other things, how well protected are they? They may be trending positively in numbers, still sort of low numbers, but trending very positively and have a lot of protection in place, a lot of government support, good habitat status, not too many direct threats. We, they, they may you know, really be doing quite well compared to a much more abundant species like black crowned or gray crowned cranes in Africa, where uh, even though the numbers are still pretty high, we're really worried about the rate of decline and um, the likelihood that those will keep going down. So that's just a great question. It's a confusing issue, but yeah, thanks for asking that. Thanks, Rich. Another question is about whether um, many of our cranes are, are highly migratory and whether that makes it much more difficult in terms of assessing their, their status, either red list or green status. Uh, definitely does. Um, 
the the uh, as I as I mentioned in the talk, migratory species, you know, have sort of a, a repeat, repeat, repeat aspect. All of all of the things we have to do at a site base to deal with threats and land conservation, water conservation, you have to repeat all along flyways to assure they can breed, they have wintering grounds, and they have the critical places in between. So flyways just make it all the more complicated. Um, as I mentioned. The red list really deals with the global population and doesn't deal as much with individual populations or places. So flyways complicate that when you have species that use multiple flyways. You may have, like with the red crown cranes, you have one flyway doing maybe okay or a resident population doing okay. And then you have another flyway where they're really doing poorly. So it can really um, make it more complicated. So we need all those tools. I'm grateful that the green status um, that process does help us much better recognize entire range and therefore really get at the flyway question much better than the red list was able to as we think about recovery. So that, that's an important tool, but um, yes, it, it is more complicated to think about flyways um, for sure. So, yeah. So the green status actually looks at uh, particularly endangered subspecies and are also isolated populations that may be there may be of least concerned species that you know are still still vulnerable. So you're saying that the green status would actually take that into account? It does. Another uh, another great question. So if you look, well, let's talk about our sandhill cranes. Assuming we have uh, a bunch of U.S. Uh, viewers here, you know, overall, wow, you know, 827,000 sandhill cranes. That's an impressive number. But the, there are the sandhill cranes in Cuba are highly endangered. The sandhill cranes in, in, in Mississippi, a very isolated population there are endangered. Even on the West Coast, uh, sandhill cranes are considered a threatened species in places like California. So what the green list helps us think about is recovery across that range. And so, as I said, you, you can never probably have 100% recovery. You're never gonna have cranes everywhere, like sandhill cranes everywhere they were let's say 200 years ago, there's probably a shopping mall or two in some of the former wetlands that were used by cranes, et cetera, et cetera. We all know that. But it helps us gauge recovery uh, that can be achieved. And so we might have a goal of saying, yeah, you know, sandhill cranes are doing really well, but hey, we want to get their population doing a lot better in Cuba, in Mississippi, um, you know, in California. A lot of people in California that care about their cranes out there, and they're not necessarily taking you know, solace that the national number is going up if, if they're worried about how they're doing out in California. And so, um, or how they're, how they're repopulating the Eastern US where they were lost and now are coming back to places where people are taking, you know, joy in that, like in Ohio and all. So the, the green status does really help us think more holistically range wide about some of those smaller populations. It weighs them, you know, it's, it's gonna, there's gonna be weight given to the overall health of the population and its growth, but it takes much more into consideration those places where there's still concern and where there's still recovery to be achieved. So that's still important, yeah. So, so Rich, another question. When, when a species gets um, downlisted or uplisted, however way you, whichever way you look at it, does that um, inspire you and ICF generally to make to, 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 to sort of spur greater efforts to A, find out more about the population and B, put, put more efforts into conservation. You could take the red crowned um, black neck example, for instance. Now black yeah. necks are okay. Do we need not need to bother about those, but, but the red crowns, do we need to find out much more information? Yeah, great question. And uh, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I mean, those examples that I gave, I think red crown are a good example where, you know, again, again the red list is, is a quantitative data driven look at trends. And the overall population of red crown cranes is trending up, therefore, they have a little bit better status. But I think we know uh, that a world where the only remaining red crown cranes is on the island of Hokkaido, Japan on feeding stations is not a world we strive for, right? So we want to figure out how to keep cranes safe in the DMZ of Korea, how to keep cranes safe in China and Russia. You know, it's a bigger picture than just their um, survival. And so, the, and so I, I don't celebrate the new status of red crown cranes because I, I, I worry about it sending a mixed signal, to be honest. Um, and with the, black, with the black neck cranes though, 
I think there is time to pause and just celebrate some great work, all the protected areas in China, the, the really big commitment that's been made by the Chinese and the Bhutanese to the future of um, the black neck crane. I think that's a great thing. We are worried about climate change. We are gonna have to be innovative in thinking about their future, but there's lots to celebrate there. So in that case, I think it is a celebration. So you know, I guess to say it's case by case, but there's always a story behind the story. <laughs> and, and I guess that's, that's what the green list helps us with. And maybe even like the ICF blue list helps us with is you know understanding the story by the, behind the story. So we're never just looking at data and trends as the only, the only part of the conservation story. So. Yeah, I, I really support the success story for, for black neck cranes. It's just, it is a wonderful story. And a lot of dedication from a lot of people for that species. So we have two final questions, which, which relate more to the last part of your talk about ICF's activities. Um, one of them from Jean, do you believe that adoption as a crane for a country like Blue Crane would be for perhaps South Africa, influences communities to care and make more conservation uh, 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 encourage conservation of species and other 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 types of this other other types of process like this that maybe um, that can be used to encourage conservation. Yeah, oh, what an interesting question. So I, I mean, my first reaction is absolutely. I think that awareness and education have a huge role in all of this. Um, and, and when a crane is a national bird or can otherwise be uh, trumpeted, shall we say in the crane world, uh, I think it helps a lot. And uh, so I, I, think, I think it's very important. I, you know, these festivals, there's more than 30 crane festivals around the world. I think they're very inspiring and motivating. Uh, again, like I said, I was just out at the Yampa Festival in Colorado as a recent example, that group came around to deal with conservation of cranes. They're reaching out to ranchers to try and promote conservation there. I think any of these things, whether it's a national bird status or festivals or uh, uh, other, all other kinds of awareness that we can do out there, school programs and all, it, it does help. And, and I think in an interesting way, one of the places where, we, where that can really help is where values are changing over time. There might be say sort of ancient values for cranes among people that maybe aren't shared by the newest generations by ancient, I mean like for, for many generations, certain values about the sacredness of cranes that maybe are lost in new generations. So we have to find new ways to inspire people um, to still care for cranes into the future. So yeah, no, great question. Yeah, I think that's right. I know that for Siberian crane has just been adopted as the provincial bird of Jiang, Jiangxi province where Poyang Lake is situated. And that offers up all kinds of new opportunities and, and, and commitment from the, from the province to, to save the species, not just in Poyang Lake, but, but throughout, its, throughout its range. So uh, yeah, I think that's a great initiative. Mm -hmm. So the final question is um, um, back to Sandhills. And it's about the, um, it's, a, it's from Larry and it says in Michigan, um, we allow farmers to shoot sandhill cranes if they are, quote, problem with their crops, but actually very few are shot. So his question is um, whether ICF is um, aware of this and, um, and maybe able to offer uh, alternative controls than shooting cranes. Oh, yeah, great question. Well, this, uh, this is another webinar, so I'm going to give you a an unsatisfying short answer, but just to say this is something we think about a lot and um, is a big part of our strategic planning going forward as we think about the Sand Hill recovery, so important. Uh, uh, Ann Lacey, who you've heard on these webinars before, uh, and her team were, you know, this is a big part of our thinking going forward. But in, in short, uh, definitely, yes, we are aware about permits uh, given in Michigan and here in Wisconsin to shoot sandhill cranes on farms when um, crop depredation is assumed. Uh, not all of those permits are filled, but we think it does uh, lead to shooting of a lot of cranes. Um, and also, as I mentioned briefly during my talk, there is now pressure, for example, here in Wisconsin, very clear pressure for a hunt. And that hunt, if you, if you read about how it's promoted, is entirely linked to solving the problem for farmers. You know, it, 
and 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 I think that a a a, a unclear and uh, sort of untrue connection. I'll be honest. I think that we can much better solve the problem of cranes on farms with other methods, like. ICF was very involved in developing Avapel, a non-toxic treatment that you can apply to corn that's distasteful to cranes. What does it do when cranes taste it? They switch to eating grubs and other things, waste seed that are beneficial to farms. Uh, so th they can become beneficial in the farming landscape uh, when we use alternatives. Well, we also know Avapel costs money. So how can we get it out to more farmers? Can we get Avapel treated on all seed that goes out because everyone has crop depredation problems get it get it on the seed originally as it comes out for example um so the so the cost can be built in and be much much cheaper uh for farmers there, there are ways to solve crop depredation and if if when hunts are promoted they should be discussed purely as a hunt should cranes be hunted or not um that's the issue uh not as a, a sort of excuse for solving crop depredation because there are other ways to do it um, and I think ways that will ultimately be more successful for farmers and for the species. So there, there, there's a lot packed in there, but um, it's, it's a great question and something we are going to go very deep on uh, in planning now and in, in the future. And I think you can count on us uh, to take a leadership role on that issue. So thank you for that question. Okay, thanks, Rich. That, that's all the all the questions and really all the time we have for now. So thanks very much again for your presentation. Very, very clear, very, very useful. And I'm sure that um, if there are more questions, which would be happy to answer them online. So please send uh, any future questions or any clarifications that you might have. Uh, otherwise, I, I'll hand you back to Rich now. Thank you, Spike. Thanks so much for helping. And thanks everybody for the questions today. I really appreciate it. Uh, our next From the Field webinar is in October. Like I said, we're not, we're not doing these weekly anymore as we were last year, but we're still doing, um, still doing them. And we hope you will enjoy this one on the Siberian crane autumn migration in Eastern Russia. That's coming up on October 21st. You'll see more about that. All of you who signed up today will get notice about that. And then finally, uh, just again, thank you for your support. This is all made possible by you, thanks to our sponsors today very much um, uh, for this webinar and for future webinars. Um, if you'd like to make a gift or become a member, please look us up on our website. And thank you uh, for joining today. I'll let this, this screen linger for a moment for anybody who wants to copy down our website. Of course, you can Google us and all that good stuff. And thank you uh, for being with us today. And thank you for caring about cranes and uh, the wonderful world of cranes. So. Thank you. Have a great day.